Good evening. Thank you very much for tuning in. Today I would like to assemble a video on the subject of resistors. Now why am I doing this? Well I have a specific reason in mind. The thing is I've been reading a very large textbook on electronics and it goes into describing the various types of resistors and it's very comprehensive. It covers virtually every type. And the problem with the textbook? It's black and white. It's just text and it doesn't really provide pictures for all the different types of resistors. So that's not very helpful. Almost a catalog would be better than reading just black and white text. So I'm going to create this video with the effort of putting pictures to the various types of resistors. I would like to take it kind of slow because I think it's more enjoyable to watch a video that's at a very slow pace, especially when it's technical subject matter. So I'll start by just dropping a definition of what a resistor is. Certainly resistors perform many different tasks within electronics and they might be the most common and most used component of all. I'll let you debate that one. But here's a definition as to the function of what a resistor does. Resistors perform two basic functions in electronics. First, they limit current flow and they set voltage levels within a circuit. Now they do a whole lot of other things too, but those are the two primary functions of a resistor in a circuit. To limit current flow and to set voltage levels within a circuit. Now without getting complicated very quickly, I can think of the way that resistors are used in like an op-amp circuit where they're not really used to limit current flow or to set voltage levels. Well they are used to adjust voltage but they're used as references in a way to determine gain. In a way that is setting voltage levels but it doesn't actually set voltage levels for the purpose of how a circuit works. It's really just setting voltage levels so that the internal components inside the integrated circuit of an op-amp will know which gain to create as an output. So that's one example I can think of that actually doesn't follow this definition I initially provided. Again, the definition is that resistors perform two basic functions, which is limiting current flow and setting voltage levels. So I just thought that would be a good way to start because there's a huge list of different functions that resistors perform in this textbook I'm reading and I could list them all but I don't think it's very helpful unless they're meticulously explained and, and broken down unless of course you already know this so okay for instance it says resistors are used to set operating current and signal levels in circuits provide voltage reduction set precise gain values in precision circuits that sounds like op, -amp, op amps act as shunts in ammeters and voltage meters behave like damping agents in oscillators and timer circuits act as bus and line terminators in digital circuits, provide feedback networks for amplifiers, and act as pull-up and pull-down elements in digital circuits. Well, that's all very true, but unless you know what all of those are, it's, it's not very meaningful. And I wanted this to be a basic video on resistors. So I guess at the very basis, or essence, resistors can come in a few different types, a few different versions. They could be a fixed resistor. So it's a value of resistor that does not change. It's fixed. I don't know, a 10K resistor would be an example. Variable resistors, potentiometers. Some people say potentiometers, POTS. That's a variable resistor where you can adjust the resistance level. Very useful, but that's a different type than a fixed resistor. A fixed resistor, the resistance doesn't change. A variable resistor, you can adjust the resistance. There are digitally adjustable resistors. Resistors can also be used as fuses. Resistors, particularly ones made of the element selenium, can be used as photoresistors, which are dependent upon ambient light to determine the resistance value. You can imagine something like that would be very useful in having lights that come on on your property at home when the sun starts to go down, when it starts to get dark. And then there are also resistor arrays and these typically come in a package that look a lot like an integrated circuit 
but they're not really but they come in a in an inline package that you could pop into a breadboard that's a resistor array or a network and those are made often for the sake of saving space and they're used in finished products for ease of use and manufacturing so here's some schematic symbols of resistors fixed variable suppose that you want to create your very first circuit or a very simple circuit and you want to power an LED light and you want to do this with a 9 volt battery well if you hook up an LED directly to the terminals of a 9 volt battery you will likely burn out your LED assuming you hooked up the polarity correctly an LED of course being a diode and it only allows current to pass in one direction so assuming you hook up the polarity correctly of your LED directly to a 9 volt battery in most cases with most LEDs you'll probably just burn out the LED and it'll make a little bit of smoke a pop a smoke and maybe a bad smell so anyway if you want to preserve your LEDs and have them work correctly well you would want to add a resistor to the circuit so probably at least 220 ohms but maybe more so a a resistor can also protect components within a circuit from burning out not only this but suppose you use a potentiometer a pot or a variable resistor all means the same thing you can actually control the intensity or brightness of your LED now I've already dropped this definition once or twice where I said that resistors perform two basic functions in electronics one was to limit current flow and the other was to set voltage levels within a circuit and the second one is what I'm going to try and explain now so if you hook up two resistors in series if you hook up two resistors in series there will be a point in between those two resistors with a specific voltage value so let's just say you are using a 9 volt battery to power your circuit you will have 9 volts powering resistor 1 and this resistor 1 is hooked up in series to resistor 2 but guaranteed that the, res the voltage value or the voltage across R1 is going to be different than the voltage across R2 and the voltage will certainly be different before R1 as between R1 and R2 the point of this is to sort of drop the idea of what a voltage divider is so again I'm going to repeat it resistors perform two basic functions in electronics one is to limit current flow and the other is to set voltage levels within a circuit so again dwelling on this latter idea here that resistors can be used to set voltage levels if you hook up two resistors in series and that point in between those two resistors will create a separate voltage between the two voltage being pressure the pressure that pushes current through the circuit so in this way resistors can be used very usefully to create different voltages within a circuit and different components operate effectively at different voltages whether it's LEDs or motors or ICs or whatever they all require different voltages and they have different voltage ratings again LEDs will burn out if you put too much voltage and current through them so voltage dividers are very useful for setting different voltage levels within your circuit and this is achieved by hooking up resistors in series that's one in front of the other that's opposed to hooking up resistors in parallel and that can be useful too but this is how you create a voltage divider and it's done through resistors now without getting too technical into explanation digital what's digital this is sort of changing the subject what's digital digital is a type of circuit that deals with binary numbers zeros and ones low current or no current would be attributed a low and a high current would be treated as a one so zeros and ones so a low current can be attributed a zero and a high current can be attributed a one right this is the essence of how computers function how calculators work so you can create meaning and you can ascribe meaning to a high output or a low output and these the essence of it being high or low is also attributed the term a bit one bit of information well practically if you assemble a circuit with different resistors using voltage dividers you can create highs and lows using voltage dividers and say you're using an Arduino or a microcontroller that's sensing these different voltage levels you can use your microcontroller 
to analyze your circuit. If you hook it up, you know, hook up some of the input out pins as well input pins, and you can sense the different uh, highs and lows within your circuit, and your microcontroller can react accordingly. So this is basically explaining that you know, resistors can be used to create digital signals of highs and lows, and that ties into using microcontrollers and Arduinos, which is popular these days. Maybe that wasn't the best explanation of how resistors are used in digital circuits, but I tried my best. Again, this is sort of an unscripted video. Again, back to the basic definition. Resistors perform two basic functions in electronics, to limit current flow and to set voltage levels within a circuit. Well, I sort of explained the second one already, the second idea that you can set voltage levels with resistors, putting them in series and creating voltage dividers. But this first idea, that you can limit current flow, actually has a technical term, and that's called attenuation. When you attenuate a resistor, all I recommend doing is taking your multimeter, and with the two leads, set your multimeter to uh, DC resistance, and you can measure a, res a resistor, and you can pretty much find out the value of the resistor that way. Or you could look at the color bands written on the resistor, but even then, if you have the internet, uh, you can Google the color band on a resistor and probably have uh, you know an instantaneous resistor value pop up on Google. So you don't really need to know color coding for resistors. I think that's an old thing. I stand to be corrected. And I don't really study it or try to figure that out too much. Oh. But I guess it's worth mentioning. That's why resistors look the way they do. Now, there are a number of things to consider when selecting a resistor for a given application. Two primary considerations including include selecting the appropriate nominal resistance and power rating. The next step is to develop an acceptable tolerance for the resistor that ensures it will function properly in all extremes of the application. This task can be a bit difficult because it requires understanding a variety of non-ideal characteristics that vary from one resistor family or even between resistors in the same family to another. Well, I won't lie to you, I just read that out of a textbook. And basically, oh, what's it actually saying? Does that make any sense to you? kind of makes sense to me. It's very wordy. But um, I think what it basically is saying is, is that there's different types of resistors. Well, here's a metal film resistor. Here's a wire wound resistor. Now, ideally, a resistor is only that. It's a resistor and it impedes the flow of current in a circuit. But in reality, a resistor can actually have other types of impedance, particularly say this special type of resistor called a wire wound resistor, which actually has a resistive wire inside it. And of course, if you know anything about inductors, that's very similar to a coil. And a, a coil or an inductor will prevent change in current within a circuit. So say you have, oh, I don't know, I'll pull out a number, 30 milliamps running through your little DC circuit. Add in an inductor, and that circuit will resist any change of the current passing through it. So say you have a circuit with an inductor and a motor, and the motor switches on and off. Well, if you put an, in, an inductor within the circuit, when the motor switches off, the inductor has a tendency to continue drawing the same amount of current through the circuit, even though the load is now turned off. This can be very damaging to a circuit because an inductor can continue drawing current from the battery, which powers your circuit, and if you don't have a load attached, this additional current that it's drawing without a load, like a motor running anymore, can actually damage components within your circuit. So anyway, that's why inductors are bad within a circuit. But once again, I'm trying to explain resistors. So you can have different types of resistors, and there's a certain type of resistor which is kind of used for precision, which is called a wire-wound resistor. And it almost behaves a little bit like an inductor because it does have a resistive wire coiled up with inside its construction. So this is not really an ideal or theoretically fundamental type of resistor. It's actually acting a little bit like an inductor. Again, an inductor does not like change within current flowing through the circuit. So if you have this wire wound resistor in your circuit, it's going to behave a little bit like an inductor. Resistors provide impedance to current. Believe it or not, capacitors or capacitance and inductance can actually provide a type of impedance as well. So because, again, inductance will prevent any change in current flow. So there are different types of resistors for different applications, one being a wire wound resistor, and these aren't exactly like ideal resistors. They have a little bit of induction within their physical makeup. Now there's a few reasons why you have to be diligent in selecting the correct 
resistor in a circuit that you might be designing, because resistors, in performing their task of impeding the flow of current, produce a lot of heat or wasted energy. So if you use very high value resistors, say like one mega ohm of resistance as a resistor in your circuit, um, just because Oh, well, for whatever reason, you have to consider the fact that uh, you might end up with power losses because of an incorrectly chosen value for your resistor. Different resistors, say in like an audio circuit, will introduce noise. So there's different manufacturing techniques of different resistors, and some of them are superior to others in certain respects. But noise is also one consideration with the different manufacturer of resistors. Certain types of resistors, because of the way they work, can add noise into a circuit. Also, resistors are susceptible, once again, to being to burning out if you don't choose the appropriate one for the power level you have within your circuit. So you'll see often when you buy resistors on eBay or in a, an electronics store, uh, resistors, as well as other components, will have a power rating. And I don't know, a lot of the ones that I buy usually say uh, 0.25 watts on them before it says the resistor value. And that means that, means that your resistor can withstand a quarter watt of power. Now I guess to explain resistors, there's a few essential formulas right at the beginning when you learn in electronics, that being Ohm's law, and then also the power law. So here's the relationship in Ohm's law, where if you want to calculate the resistance, the voltage and current are proportional thus, and same with the power rating. Now without going into examples, uh, knowing these formulas are essential for calculating a proper resistance value within your circuit, for, for calculating the correct power limitation of what your resistor can handle, and also to ensure that you are permitting the correct voltage and current levels for the rest of the components in your circuit to work properly. Okay, I'm kind of jumping around from topic to topic. So I think I already explained resistors in series to create voltage dividers. If you actually want to find the resistance value of both of these resistors in series, you simply add the resistance values. So the total resistance would be R1 plus R2. But it's a little different when resistors are in parallel, like thus. And there's a different formula for calc calculating that. I'll just put it on the screen. I'm not going to go into explaining it very much. But um, you take the product of both resistors and you divide it by the sum. And that will give you the total resistance. When resistors are run in parallel, you have the same amount of voltage entering the resistors, but the current going through each resistor will be different. And the voltage drop across the parallel resistors should be the same. That's because they're hooked up in parallel. Okay, well, uh, changing the subject a little bit, resistors can work more or less efficiently at different ambient temperatures. So on a really hot day, a resistor will actually will probably be more resistive. You'll increase the amount of resistance within a resistor if the weather is really hot. This is why it's important to cool circuits either with heat sinks or fans, like your computer has a fan, because it's a safety hazard. So this is important when choosing resistors for your circuit design, and this has a specific name. This is called the temperature coefficient of resistance, and there are fairly simple mathematical calculations for figuring out the temperature coefficient, and I'm not going to go into it because I don't think it's interesting to listen to. My only point is that this is important to take into consideration when designing a circuit that different resistors have different temperature coefficients, and I will get into the different types of resistors, which vary in temperature coefficients. Let's just say you wanted to design a circuit to control ovens in a bakery in the summertime. Well, you're going to have to have resistors that have low temperature coefficients. I don't know if I stated that correctly. But yeah, you want to consider the, how well resistors work at different temperatures. There are many different kinds of resistors out there, each with its specific set of limitations and suitable applications. A resistor that is good for one application can be disastrous in another. Resistors designated as precision resistors, such as precision metal film, are designed for applications where tight resistance tolerance and stability are primary considerations. They generally have restricted operating temperature limits and power dissipation ratings. Power resistors, such as power wire wounds, tend to be designed to optimize power dissipation at the expense of precision, and generally have extended operating temperature limits. General purpose resistors, such as carbon film, tend to be somewhere in between and are suitable for more general applications. 
The following is a rundown of the important specifications used when selecting resistors. You can find detailed specifications for real resistors by checking out manufacturer data sheets. Again, I think I already talked about it, but different resistors have different voltage ratings as to what they can handle. If you exceed them, potentially they could catch fire or melt, so you always want to choose a resistor that has a much higher voltage rating that exceeds what's required for your circuit. This is for safety reasons, particularly when dealing with a resistor within a power supply. So basically, most electronic devices that plug into the wall at home have to first convert the alternating current in your mains electricity in your house to DC. Sometimes this is an external wall wart that you have to plug into the wall and then plug into your device. Sometimes a power supply is already built in to the device. Say your computer or your printer or maybe a stereo receiver, there's probably a power supply within that device. The power supply takes the AC, converts it to DC. So you can expect that there are going to be resistors among diodes and inductors, but resistors that have high voltage ratings and that are resistant to catching fire as well. And if you have resistors in a power supply and you are trying to repair a power supply, you should never replace the resistors in a power supply unless they actually have a high voltage rating and you know are safe and are not flammable. Another component in understanding resistors is the tolerance. And the tolerance is almost like, well, if you're familiar with like a metal machine shop that makes machine parts, there's a certain tolerance of the dimensions of a particular machine part as to how much you can go over or under. And, you know, this will be in within thousandths of a, of a meter or even smaller. Well, resistors are the same. There's a certain tolerance. They can be plus or minus two, five, or ten percent of the rated value of the resistor. Me personally, I've noticed that all the resistors I've ever bought are pretty accurate to what the package description says. If it's a 10k resistor, well, chances are it's, you know, within a milliohm of, of what it's supposed to be. Just from my experience, most resistors that I bought for very cheap on eBay or at the store are usually with in well under 2% tolerance. So I guess tolerance is a concept. But resistors are pretty well made these days. I don't think you're going to find resistors that have a 20% tolerance, like my textbook tends to suggest. Again, I, I kind of mentioned before that you know there's an ideal theoretical concept of what a resistor is supposed to be, and that's to limit current flow and to regulate and set voltage values. But in reality, they're not always perfect, and they can introduce a certain amount of inductive and capacitive features within your circuit. Now, this can start affecting signals within your circuit. Say you're dealing with radios or something. You know, the frequency response of certain resistors may not be ideal, and you have to take into consideration the different manufacturer of different resistors, right? So there are some resistors that provide a better frequency response in essence preserving the signal better without introducing noise. You know when you get into radio people have different types of filters like bandpass filters that will try to eliminate you know lower frequencies or higher frequencies and therefore resistor capacitor combinations can be used. So frequency response is one way to measure different resistors and different applications will actually require more precision when it comes to preserving signals and creating filters and other types of things. Apparently foil resistors. Foil resistors are better at preserving the input. This has never been something that I've much had to pay attention to in hobby electronics. I suppose if you operate some type of scientific lab or work for the military or have some kind of electronic device that requires incredible precision, then maybe frequency response will be a consideration for you when you choose resistors. Now, I think I already mentioned it, but different resistors can introduce noise within a circuit and there's different reasons. I'm not going to go into defining all the different types of noise as my textbook does, but I will mention them. Perhaps maybe I'll Google these later. But there's something called Johnson noise. Johnson noise. And what other types of noise? Current noise. And contact noise. And shot noise. And if I look at my text, there's very technical explanations as to all the different types of noise. And I don't think it's terribly interesting and trying to explain it all in this video. But yes, there are different types of noise in selecting a resistor. Well, noise is a consideration and the different types of noise. 
There's another way of measuring resistors. Well, actually, the textbook I'm looking at lists three. There's stability, reliability, and temperature rating. Stability, this is defined as the repeatability of resistance of a resistor when measured at reference temperature and subjected to a variety of operating and environmental conditions over time. So basically, you know, I guess you have a resistor in a circuit. Yeah, it's subject to age and wear and even things like humidity. Well, I guess they're saying that wire wound, generally wire wound at bulk metal resistor designs are best as far as like maybe longevity and stability. So that's, I guess, something to consider. I don't think this is something that is terribly important for just a hobbyist. Reliability is the degree of probability that a resistor will perform its desired function. It's typically rated as a mean time between failures. That's also a kind of the same thing as stability, but it's more specific as giving like a time rating as to the number of hours it should be able to operate for. And uh, temperature ratings kind of covered that already. Now different types of resistors. This is really why I wanted to make the video in the first place, because there are different types. And let me see just a quick look. My textbook mentions 13 or 14 different types of resistors, and it goes into very fine detail into explaining them all. And the very difficult thing about this is that it doesn't provide any pictures. So it's, I'm sure it's accurate, but it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you read it. So this is really what I wanted to assemble. Precision wire wound resistors. Precision wire wound. Precision wire wound resistors are very stable resistors manufactured with high tolerances. They are made by winding wire of nickel chromium alloy onto a ceramic tube covered with a vitreous coating. They are designed to have a very low temperature coefficient of resistance and can achieve accuracies up to 0.005 percent. So these these are very accurate, very precise. They're very precise, precision wound. I guess if you're going to design a very reliable multimeter that you really want to have accurate ratings on, well you would probably use precision wire wound resistors within your multimeter. For the hobbyist, it probably doesn't matter. Power wire wound. Power wire wound resistors are similar to the precision counterparts but are designed to handle a lot more power. They will handle more power per unit volume than any other resistor. So this is probably like power supplies and stuff. Some of the most powerful are wound similar to heater elements and require some form of cooling. So you got to cool these things down as well. And I guess I could go into explaining it but the actual physical size of a resistor does seem to impact the ability to dissipate heat within a resistor. So I guess that's a consideration in power wire wound resistors. Okay, metal film. In applications that involve fast rise times, microseconds, or high frequencies, megahertz, metal film resistors are usually the best. They are also quite cheap and come in small sizes. Surface mount. Metal film resistors are often considered the best compromise of all resistors. Once considered less accurate and stable than wire wounds, the technology has greatly improved with special precision metal film resistors reaching temperature coefficient values as low as 20, 10, 5, and even 2 parts per million per, per degree Celsius. Carbon film. This is probably what you're buying when you buy resistors for your hobby electronics. They're probably the most common type. And if you're not sure what a resistor is and you bought it for hobby electronics, it's probably carbon film. Carbon film resistors are the most common resistor around. They are made by coating, dipping, rolling, printing, or spraying a ceramic substrate with a special carbon film mixture. The thickness and percentage of the carbon mixture roughly determine the resistance. Carbon composition. This, well, so what's the difference? I just mentioned carbon film, so what's the difference between carbon film and carbon composition? Well, I don't know if I'm going to answer that, but I'm going to read this a little bit. Carbon composition. Carbon composition resistors, though not as popular as they once were, still find use in non-critical applications. They are composed of carbon particles mixed with a binder. The resistance value is varied by controlling the carbon concentration. This mixture is molded into a cylindrical shape and hardened by baking. Leads are attached axially, axially to each end, and the assembly is encapsulated in a protective coating. I think this is like an older technology. I could be wrong, and I stand to investigate this further. But I think these are like older types of resistors. Apparently, and I did read here that actually carbon composition are kind of good for like voltage spikes, and they're actually kind of resistant to like high voltage fluctuations. 
The downside is that these carbon composition resistors are not very precise, and they have poor tolerances, but they are good for flashovers and like voltage overloads, so they can handle high power capability. So that is actually one benefit to these. So I'm thinking that they're probably used in maybe closer to the power side, power supply section of a, an electronics device. Okay, the next type listed here is bulk metal foil resistors. Foil resistors are similar in characteristics to metal films. They have better stability and lower TCRs, lower temperature coefficients. So I guess these bulk metal foil resistors are good for maybe if it gets really hot. And they're a little bit more precise, approaching those of precision wire wounds and accuracy about that of metal film resistors. High precision versions can achieve tolerances as low as 0.005% and low TCR values. TCR was temperature coefficient, so they're good in probably hot environments. I'd love to find some actual practical applications for all these different types of resistors as to where they're best used. This textbook I'm reading, kind of drawing from, doesn't really cover that. Maybe uh, an electronics repair guy would know would know this stuff better than I do. I, I didn't really know all the resistor types until today when I started reading this book. Filament resistors. The filament resistors are similar to what's called bathtub boat resistors, except they are not packaged in a ceramic shell boat. The individual resistive element with the leads already crimped is coated with an insulating material, generally a high temperature varnish. Uh, doesn't really say what they're good for that much. I guess they're cheaper. TCR, the temperature coefficient stability are not that important. And then they're, I guess they're cheaper filament resistors. I don't know what they look like. By the time you're watching this, I'll probably have a picture on the screen that shows what they look like. Thin and thick film resistors. These are really not axial lead types, it looks like. These are like almost like surface mount. Thin film resistors are made by depositing an extremely thin layer of nickel chromium resistive film on an aluminum oxide substrate while using nickel, I don't know what that element is, materials as conducting electrodes. So these are like probably surface mount type of resistors. Thin film technology offers extreme precision and stability, tight tolerances, and low TCR values. I bet they're expensive if they're that good. However, these resistors have relatively limited surge capabilities, so you can blow them really easily, just like a lot of... Power film resistors. Power film resistors are similar in manufacture to their respective metal film or carbon film resistors. They are manufactured and rated as power resistors, with power rating being the most important characteristic. So these are for, like, power supplies. Power film resistors are available in higher maximum values than power wire-wound resistors and have a very good frequency response. Again, frequency response was sort of like preserving the input signal or the current going through metal oxide power metal oxide film flame proof. So this is a different type. Metal oxide resistors contain a resistance element formed by the oxidation reaction of a vapor or spray of tin chloride solution on the heated surface of a glass or ceramic rod. The resulting tin oxide film is adjusted to value by cutting a helix path through the film. Now it's getting a little complex. Metal oxide resistors are used in general purpose voltage dividers, RC timing circuits, they also come with a maximum resistance values exceeding those of wire-wound resistors. In general, they have a decent electrical and mechanical stability and high reliability. Next type, fuse resistors. That's almost self-explanatory. So a fuse resistor is basically like a resistor that is a fuse. And I think it said somewhere in this text that they actually are almost packaged in the form of a fuse so that they can actually sit within a fuse holder. Now I better read more specifically to find out if that's true. Where did it say that? Oh, here it says it specifically. Many fuse resistors are made to mount in fuse clips for more accurate fusing characteristics. So I think that says what I said. And it says they're used in battery chargers, TV sets, cordless phones, PCs, PCs CPU coolers, and so on. Okay, next, a different type, chip resistor arrays. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but these basically look like um, almost like integrated circuit type packages within resistors contained inside. And it says they come in single inline packages and dual inline packages. Dual inline package, if you're not familiar, just means that it can pop in to a breadboard and it sort of has legs on two opposite sides, where a single inline package is just like legs on one side and it sort of stands vertical, with maybe within your breadboard too. But anyway, this... This looks like a type of resistor that's kind of used for manufacturing, so you're probably going to use a lot of them, and maybe you've got people in a manufacturing facility who would manually solder connections to all, all the different resistors contained in this one chip, 
almost. I, I, it's not really calling it a chip. It's calling it a chip resistor array. I guess it is a chip. And I guess they're you know just a bunch of different resistors within a single chip. Cement resistors. I this is new to me. These resistors are designed as power resistors with the added provision of being heat and flame resistant. Well, I don't think I work with anything at a hobby level that's going to come anywhere close to having such high flame and heat resistance, so that's maybe why I've never seen these before. But I suppose if, if you're probably working with, well, that's a safety thing, looks like to me, a cement resistor. I've seen these before. I did work in electronics manufacturing for a time, and I did come across zero ohm resistors. I also built a hobby kit by Velleman, which was an FM radio, and it had a zero ohm resistor. I could never figure out why anybody would manufacture a resistor with zero ohms. And the textbook doesn't actually give a lot of explanation as to why you would even want a zero ohm resistor, although it did say that like PCB placement machinery used these type of zero ohm resistors. I'm thinking like a little robot might come in, pick one of these up, pop it in the board, and it actually kind of is easier, more easily manipulated by manufacturing processes. Maybe that's the reason. Rather than having a little jumper cable, a little wire, well, that might fall out of the board. It might be hard to handle. Otherwise, it, there's actually not a huge amount of explanation as to why a zero ohm resistor is completely necessary. But I know they do exist. I've seen them on a few occasions. So I guess that's something to think about for later. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something, and forgive any mistakes I made. Have a good day.